Welcome to episode 566 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton. He's Levon, a.k.a. Barcelev. And things are pretty grim right now with the injuries to both Frankie de Young and Pedri. So I thought we'd do a listener question show to handle both the positive and the negative, because if you're listening to the show, if you watch my show, you know we can exist in both those spaces. How does that sound, Levon? Yeah, let's rock. All right, so we are going to rock and start with that rocking and rolling with questions from the Patreons. As people know, or they don't know, I've been told that people don't know, um, I am pretty spread thin, but you still do get two big perks for Patreon. I don't make special content there, but the two big perks for joining the Patreon show as low as $3 here in the US, you get the podcast without the ads, and you're guaranteed to have your question answered on the show. Even when I don't do listener question show, just message me or let me know, and I'll answer that on the next show or one of those shows that it fits. So unlike the Discord and Facebook group, where I do usually have to make some cuts and questions for time, can't guarantee I'll get to all of them. The Patreon questions, we always get to. And that is why we begin with those questions, starting with one from Patreon Daniel. I like this question, actually. What's next for Shabby? Say you were Shavi's agent. I like that he also set this up for us. This is, this is a, Daniel, I don't know if your background is in journalism or in content creation, but I like this. So say we are Shavi's agent. We're putting ourselves in Shavi's agent's shoes. Taking into account only the sporting aspect, so not fatigue, wanting to take a year off, or potential Saudi Arabian or Qatar windfall. So we're not letting him go to those places or take a year off. Where would you advise him to go? Do you think that there are environments where he could really grow or thrive or certain options that you'd avoid like the plague? Now, do you have an answer for this? Because I actually have some like legitimate like clubs to actually throw at you here. Um, but do you have like more broad examples? Um, yeah, head coach of like one of those uh, Pacific islands, like Samoa or something. Uh <laughs> Really? <laughs> no, I, I you know, and, and like you, you, you told me that he can't take a sabbatical. So I'm just like, okay. <laughs> off the cuff, I'm just thinking like, what, what is the closest to a sabbatical that it can be, uh, and still yeah. be a coach? You know. Well, let's say then, like a year from now, after he took that year off, right? Like, let's say like his next job. I mean, uh, I also think it's, it's it's a very interesting question, but um, I think more than answering the question, this is where Xavi uh, built his career all the way wrong. Um, you know, I always criticize him for coaching in Qatar, um, not just because of uh, everything that we can criticize Qatar for, but, you know, you can also criticize the United States or you yeah, can also that, criticize yeah. Spain. So yeah. let's, not, let's not get in that. But yeah. from a pure um uh development perspective as a coach qatar is not ideal so um, barca b would have been ideal and uh luis Enrique went barca b and then he went to uh rome rome didn't work out so well then he went a step down to celta de vigo mm-hmm. before he came to barca like that that is the kind of experience that Xavi uh, needed before coming to Barcelona. Um, And it is very difficult to first go to Barcelona, then have Barcelona not work out because now where where are you going to go? Yeah, you're trying to Um, engineer it. So so that was the idea I had, actually. So that was the idea that I think after quote-unquote underwhelming at Barcelona, where do you go? Uh, and the two things I thought of was a league that is slightly different, but similar, and then a lot less pressure. So that was my idea. Like, how do you reverse engineer basically, you know, the hill? I mean, it started on the hill with Barcelona. Now you have to go through the valley and build yourself back up. So it was, I basically went with a project that he could in theory turn around and that would work for him because I still do think that looking at Xavi, people loved him as a player enough that they want him and they will give him a few chances. Like, and I'm looking at people like Wayne Rooney, Frank Lampard, and a ton of other manager, uh, players turned managers that have been given a much larger leash as managers than, than, than others, right? Because, I mean, even Terry Henry, he is completely, re- again, one of my favorite players of all time, but one of the guys that I would love to meet. Um, also one of the like, favorite people I've heard about behind the scenes. Like, I have friends who work with CBS, like with him, and he's just a joy to work with. But like, I also covered him in, with, when he was in Montreal and like, and, and even with his time in Monaco, like it didn't work out. Like he just, he wasn't a great manager and he is, we've all forgotten that completely <laughs> because Terry Henry is just so gosh darn classy and, and awesome as a pundit, right? It's just, and I think Xavi the same right. way. Like, you just want the dude to succeed because 
he was just such a blessing, like a joy to watch as a player. So what I'm looking at as where he would go, and I do have some examples here. I'm looking at Serie A and Liga Enekis, and I'm looking, and I even looked at the tables to say, now I don't know about the, I'm not 100% on the club manager situation of these clubs, but I'm looking at teams in Serie A that probably are going to miss out on European football, that he can take on those projects with quote unquote big clubs, but with way less pressure than Barcelona. Like, so likely if Napoli, even Napoli, if they don't keep Francesco Calzona and he just stays with the Slovakian national team or like Fiorentina or Girona. And then I look at Liga Emekis recently started. I know it's the beginning of the season, but over the summer, an underachieving historic team like um, Club Lyon or Pumas, which is in Mexico City. So it's like a huge place, but they're the, they're the little brothers to Club America. So I, I think that th- that's the kind of level that Xavi could succeed and then get some goodwill back for himself to see kind of what came after that. So basically it's like you stay in Europe or you even move to Mexico and, you know, again, almost reverse engineering what Pep Guardiola did where he had, he went to, was it Brescia in Serie A as an assistant coach. And then he went to Liga MX. Like I almost, you know, very similar thinking like leagues that I know, like Serie A and La Liga, like, you know, there are the piece of play. Guardiola went to those places as a player though, right? Um, but then he stayed, well, he stayed on or went back as an assistant coach. He was never a head, okay, he was never okay, a head okay. coach in the locations, but he stayed on like, and, and at that point too, he was like 38 and already taking his or 37 or whatever, and taking his, um, his coaching courses at the time as well. So it was like, he was transitioning out of his, his player time. Uh, would you say Liga MX is, um, better than the MLS? I would say that. So there's 18 teams. There's more teams in Liga MX, uh, in, in MLS by a, a, a number. So like the bottom level of MLS with, that aren't, that don't, that don't have ma- uh, owners that are like really putting investment in, you know, if the best team in MLS plays the worst team in MLS, I think there's a bigger gap there than the top and bottom of Liga MX. Does that make sense? But I do think that there are more at this point, I would say the top six of both leagues, I would take MLS slightly over Liga MX, top six or eight. But again, like the the power from week to week between the league, I would still slightly go with Liga Mekis because again, they have 18 to what is 31 teams, I believe, in MLS, which does right. again get a bit inf- um, inflated with the bottom of rosters and talent and all that stuff. Also, even financially, like Liga, Mek- Liga Mekis still, their rosters are are much more expensive than, which isn't necessarily like mean oh, success. Really? Um, well, because all all the big names are in in in, in the United States. Like it, well, most of them were in Inter Miami, though. <laughs> so, there okay. it is. They all they mostly play with Messi, and whether you want to argue or not that that team is uh, is complying with their you know <laughs> league rules and all that stuff, that's another story for another time. But I, I mean, obviously, yes. In, as it's currently stated, I would start with Inter Miami if I'm talking about any club in either of those leagues. If that if that's what the, if that's what you're asking, asking. Ask I, I was just going to say it'd be a riot if uh, Xavi decides to uh, coach Messi. Busquets and and Alba at Inter Miami. Um, I, I really, I, mean, I really Tata, like your Tata's idea. Of... If I, you know, I would agree with you if Tata Martino wasn't the man because Messi and Tata, like they're they're on the same page, like they, that's their project. So I would, I, if it wasn't Tata, I would say no. But I, I think he's pretty sound there. Uh, but I think I think it would be a terrible idea for Xavi anyway. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, he, he needs a he needs a total reset. Uh, I like Liga MX because it's uh, very much out of the spotlight. Um, it can also go spectacularly wrong. But even if it goes right. really wrong, it does not really close any doors for him in Europe. Um, I said, well, if, yeah, if he goes, well, let me ask you. Let me ask you. How do you do? You remember how Wayne Rudy did at DC United? No. Exactly. Exactly. No. It, it did not go great is the answer, but like nobody knows. Exactly. Wait, That's what I'm saying. Like nobody cares. Wait, but did he coach there or as a player? He, he did both. Oh, really? He did both. I, I didn't even know. Um, not, not, Napoli, Napoli, I do think it is a little bit dangerous because, um, expectations are quite high in Napoli, e- e- even though they're having a disastrous season, they did win the league, um, last season. And, they are kind of like they have a strong squad. They are kind of expected to uh, to do well and to contend. So if Xavi messes up there, then um, that that's also why I thought it was very smart of Luis Enrique to just uh, fr- from Roma in, in in Rome he failed, and he really decided to go way down to Celta Vigo. 
and he did well enough there. Uh, and there's also the special thing that if you have a connection with Barcelona, it doesn't really matter what you did before. <laughs> Barcelona will will always come calling, right? But uh, yeah, that that, that um, Xavi is going to be in a, in a tough spot right now, uh, and we'll see. I I hope he still wants to be a coach after this because he doesn't seem too happy, um, and and he doesn't seem too happy because of criticism that he gets uh, from the Entorno, but the Entorno has been extremely mild towards him like you know he he hasn't come in for not even half of the criticism that Kuman or Luis Enrique or pretty much anybody named not named Guardiola has has received so yeah and he, I mean, he is still it. 44 so I think it would behoove him to yeah like think about his life in, in the long term right and try to build this thing and and build himself okay so we got through one question so I'm thinking that every other question is going to be a little quicker we're going to see how this goes uh patron Peter asked how do you rate Barcelona's chances without De Jong and Pedri? Who starts in the midfield for you? Um, I, I mean, I think it's pretty simple because of the number of players that are available. So the how do I rate Barca's chances? Not great. I mean, there really are no options. Like it's either Christensen or Romeo, and that doesn't really help you because you can't start them together in midfield. You can, but why would you, obviously? So you don't do that. And then that really just leaves Fermi Lopez and Sergio Roberto, who's coming back from another injury as the other two available um, in the midfield. And what I'm most concerned about is the reports that people were going back and forth about on Lemina Mall this week about his knee discomfort that may or may not be exaggerated. But if there's any discomfort at all, I would not play him. I honestly, if there's any hint of this, uh, I mean, even with Napoli the following week on Tuesday, I don't want to see him on Friday starting against Mallorca. Like he can come off the bench, but I don't want him starting against Mallorca. I would actually consider against Mallorca this weekend to start Hector Fort at left back and Cancelo at left wing, keeping Rafinha on the right. That's, I mean, that's not even like a, I've got a good idea. That's like, who's available? Uh, I also saw the reports of Xavi's considering Rafinha as the right interior, which we have seen this season. But I also don't know how that happens without Torres being available. Um, you know, and then the other obvious answer is Jao Felix gets a start on the left if Lamini Mall is actually fine on the right, and then Rafinha is your interior behind. Um, and I mean, maybe that's what you do for Napoli if you really just want to go for it at home and all that. But I mean, either way, the options are not great. It's pretty bleak. And I, I do think the players that are available do not really perfectly fit together. Like they don't solve, they solve some problems, but I think those problems that they solve overlap. And there are problems that De Young in particular solves that are, are going to be missing. And that is, that's not great because I, I think the biggest thing for me with missing those two is that Gundawan you're going to take him and you're going to give him back the responsibilities that he doesn't sh or shouldn't have that he's better when he's playing farther up where we've been watching that in recent weeks. And I, I just like drop if, 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 if Barcelona were to drop him deeper again, I just, I don't like that idea, but I, I think that's because of who's available. You've got center backs healthy and I mean, th three and a half attackers healthy. So, I mean, yeah, I, I don't, there's no good options. Um, yeah, now instead of uh, asking my opinion, you can just uh, give me a tissue so I can dry my tears. Yep. Okay, yeah. so instead, <laughs> we'll try to have you answer this one. Um, Pedro and David ask, do you think Laporta and the rest are on course to stabilize the club's financial pick a position, or have they merely freed some cash flow for short-term short signings and pushed the can down the road for harder decisions? More tissues, please. <laughs> So I, I actually, I, I'm going to zag a little bit. Of it. I'm a bit more positive about this than you are, honestly, because I'm oh, constantly really? doing that stuff. I'm a little more positive than you because as I've been saying for a while, and you know this obviously in the city, like the stadium is the big piece of all of this when we talk about mm -hmm. that and down the road. Because because Barcelona doesn't have a huge billionaire owner, gate revenue, as I, you know, pantomime a few times a, a month, it, gate revenue does matter to a club like Barcelona. And they knew they would get less fans at Mange Week but they're also getting a lot less fans even that they would have expected. So we're talking, number-wise, we're talking half of the Camp No attendance on average, which means half of gate revenue. So yes and no to that. It, it's, you know, again, nuanced, but it's yes and no to that, that answer because the levers that they pulled in the short term, yeah, that pushed the can down the road, but the can couldn't be picked up at all or whatever metaphor you want to use to, uh, until they are all until they are in the new stadium. 
because money will be tight until then. I, and because we are constantly trapped in the present with the expectations of FC Barcelona year in and year out, it'll feel like the club is on fire now um, until the stadium is even a full capacity. So that would be at, at the, the plan is right now to open or return to the, the spot of the camp. No, by November of 2024 with about 65,000 spectators, which is still about 25,000 on average, more than what's getting at most week between the first and second tiers with 50% of VIP capacity and then the museum open. And then the bulk of that work on the roof and all that will be done in 2024 with a full project to be done by the end of 2025. I also want to remind you too, that Madrid. Didn't really... Yeah. The stadium might not open in 2024. That's true. By November 24. Um, yeah. Right. And I, that, that, and that pushed I, it far. I, I, yeah. I am, I, I am hearing rumors from people who know people who work at the construction site that is not going as planned. Um, this is not wow. what we're reading. This is not what we're reading in Sport on Mundo Deportivo, where everything is like ahead of schedule or right, right on schedule. Well, um, no, nor do I know these people personally. But but I I mean listen, it's the same thing here as it is in Spain. There I have never heard of a construction project that ended on time. It wasn't over budget. Every friend I have who works in civil engineering or architect, well, not the architects, but civil engineering or in construction, it's yes, no projects on time. So November twenty twenty four, you're really saying like April twenty twenty five or May twenty twenty five. But again, in the, the big picture, though, the reminder I want to add is that Madrid didn't really spend big while their stadium was being renovated either. Like they weren't, they weren't like, and, and that's just, there's, it's a, it's a cash flow issue while the stadium is under construction. And it just so coincided. We talked about COVID and the excuses before, but also with the, with Messi leaving as well. So it was like COVID, Messi left and they, we, and, and the, the club still went ahead with the, the, the renovation on the camp. No, cause that was necessary for the future. Mm -hmm. So. You really do think of it as, I, I think 15, 20 years from now, you know, I mean, I work on the history of the club and I, you know, I, you define eras and I really do think like this five to six year stretch, I'm going to think of it in that way, that there was the a, a worldwide global pandemic, Messi left, and then, um, and then the stadium was renovated and, and all of the financial issues in the time. And hopefully it was like also coincided with La Masia having their new renewed trust after what it was like 10 years of you know, so many of the club being a part of that and, 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 and vice versa. So that is my, yeah, as I said, short term, I agree with you. Short term is tissues. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm crying blood, but then in give it three years, I'd say four years, the cash flow thing will not be an issue because Barcelona is a brand that is, that is capable of dealing with this. What I wonder though is, um, in the short term, the impact of this might destroy any hopes that we have of being competitive. So what if uh, this summer we need to sell players that we really do not, do not want to sell? What if we need to sell Lamin? Uh, if we need to sell Araujo? Um, because a lot of players where you say, you know, hey, this player is worth a lot of money and we could probably sell him. Uh, for example, Frankie de Jong, who I think had an amazing season last season. This season, he's still still very good. Uh, and he's in the prime. He should be one of the leaders of the project. Um, he theoretically would be one of those guys that you can get 100 million for. Um, and he would free up so much salary. But he'll just re refuse to, to go. So then the, the, the ones who end up going are the ones that you also don't want to lose but who are on more affordable salaries and even younger. So even more of the future of the club. Um, so this short term issue can turn into a midterm issue, uh, mm -hmm. which can also impact uh, um, our options of reinforcing the, the squad uh, from, um, because a lot of other clubs are not standing still. Right, you know, because right right now we have Manchester City and Paris Saint Germain, and a lot of players want to play for those clubs. I mean, I would argue that that Barcelona is not that they're not competing right now anyway. Like they're not like in Champions League. Like Barcelona's been off it for three years, four years now. They've not had a club that's good enough to compete for the Champions League, and Barcelona will still. I mean, historically, even at their worst, like they're going to be able to contend for the Liga. I mean, yes, Madrid might be much better than them next season, 
but I mean, they still can compete with everybody else in the Liga. Like, I don't think Barcelona, even in these two, three seasons, with I mean, with just how good, I'm not putting everything on Lamine Mall and Kubarsi or anything like that, but with just how good the players that will stick around. And again, I also look at this half glass full. Poncho had a question here. I'll throw it in now about which players you think will be out the door, most likely to be the big sale. And to your point, again, even Araujo, who would fetch 80 million, I think he doesn't want to go and same thing with Pedri. So the na- the two names that I keep saying that I think are most transferable to what everybody's looking to do is Kunde and Rafinha because of contract situations, what you would fetch for them on the transfer market and what their place in the club is. I think there are, there are ways to convince those two, Hey, you would have, you would be the man to do, to start every match and do where you want to be and do what you want to do elsewhere. We can fetch a big number for you. You can get paid big money. So I, I, th- I think when it's a musical chairs of who's like the two eye guys out, I think those two would be the ones that are convincible as to not being a major part of the project moving forward. And you could fetch a big enough number where you do honestly just kick the can down the road. Um, and then you also do see what you get. Cause Drew asked a question about the guys on loan and or would be sold. And I think it's all of them. I think all of Eric Garcia, Pablo Torre, Des, Ling Lei. And I know we're not talking big money, but if you get 12 for Des, and if you get 12 for Des, you get 15 for Lang Lei, you get 12 for Torre, you get 15 for Garcia. That's still 50 euros or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that's still 50. And then if you can get something for Kuni and something for Rafinha, then your squad hasn't changed that much. And you're able to kind of, you know, I mean, um, that, yeah, like I think, I, th- I, I think them, I, I, I'd be hesitant at Rafinha just because Lamina Mar is 17 and he should not play every match. You know, uh, um, at, at the same time, who else? Um, Balde. Alejandro Balde will be out. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, also because the, the other kid that we have for the Masia, Hector Ford, looks like he actually... Yeah, but this year he played le- he he played left back twice, and both times he, or at least the second time, he was so much better than anything we had seen from from Balde the whole season. Um, but Balde had a good enough previous season that you might still get a reasonable transfer fee for him. Yeah, and I also think, um, as I've said before, I think Julian Araujo returning is a big part of exactly. that. Exactly, they really yeah. like the right back. Yeah, then you move back to Portugal. Yeah. Left back. I could. I know I like um, Pedro and we want Balde to succeed, but I could see that as well. Yeah, fifty. Yeah. What is it like fifty mil? You think for Balde would be the number? Um, after this season, yeah. I don't know. If 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 they had sold him last season, yes. I mean, but he's a this young season. Player, this though. season, this season had an injury, and he was quite frankly just as bad as um, we all thought that he would be when we saw him play for Barca B. Right? It's just that he had like a miraculous previous season where he seemed like a completely different player mm-hmm. yeah um so yeah if you get if you get 50 million for him pull, pull that trigger uh absolutely and if somehow you can keep uh, Joao Cancelo even better because then you just play Cancelo on the left and either Araujo or Ford uh on on the right uh this might also be an argument for keeping Kunde and selling Kirstensen mm-hmm yeah. Right, because you can. All, all, although Christensen kind of surprised me in that defensive mid wall, he's not as poor as I thought he would be. Um, but I think Kunde is becoming a better right back this season than he was last season. Yeah, I'm. When I talk about when I say Kunde Murphy's name, I it has nothing to do with the on field stuff. As I said, like I'm merely looking at guys who would say yes to leaving, which as you said with Frankie Young, disqual and Lewandowski disqualifies them completely. So I'm mm-hmm. saying, like, who would say yes to leaving? Whose contracts are movable? Who would you get a nice transfer fee for? That's the only reason I say that. Exactly. And exactly. Yeah. yeah. Rafinha, because he's not really succeeding the way that he should succeed. Like, you know, if you can convince somebody that, you know, a 17-year-old kid is going to start ahead of you, then you should kind of, like, mm-hmm. uh, say, okay, you know, it's been it's been two years and I still haven't been able to make that spot mine, even though Dembele left. And Kunde theoretically, like, you keep playing him at right back and you tell him, look, um, we kind of need you to go, and you're never going to be a center back here. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and even if you're gonna, if you're looking to like change some of the formation and stuff like that, or 
or say that, Hey, we're going to probably have less one less, like we will play four midfielders. I mean, if the next manager comes and says, Hey, I want to reinforce with, I'd rather reinforce with Alice Garcia for 25 mil and, you know, add a fourth midfielder to this. And so we only need, you know, maybe to Roque, they're going to put more investment in him next year, even. So it's like, Oh, we'll play with two, you know, two center forwards up top and then we'll four midfielders, you know, behind them. Yeah. And, yeah, you, know, you can convince somebody on that. What, what, I, what I'm afraid of is that we cannot, we might not be able to register some of the players. So, right. uh, it, you know, will we, will we be able to register Gabi, for example? Um, we need to renew players like Araujo. We need to renew him. Yeah. But if we renew him, his salary is going to go up. Will we be able to register him? Well, we made a, well they made a documentary about him. So that's something. <laughs> they they did, and uh, Jean La, Jean Laporta presented uh, presented the documentary and said that he wanted to sign uh, Araujo for for life. Yeah. <laughs> but then yeah. but then he said something similar about Adama Traore when, when he brought him back to the club. So you know. Yeah. Well, I think you mentioned Gabi, and the interesting thing about Gabi is because of his timeline. And don't whenever you read about especially ACL stuff, whenever you read like things are positive, or whatever, it's not. It's still nine months. Like we're still calm down. So. I don't think they're going to even have to register him until Jan until January of next year. So if anything, like they can actually January next year. Well, because he's not going to be healthy until October. You know what I mean? Like even if he's back in training, I don't think he's going to fully recover until. You know what I mean? Like why would you re- why would you register him in August if he's not coming back till October November? Yeah, but then you still need to register him in August because you want him on the pitch in October November. He's Gavi. You cannot say you, you cannot tell Gavi, hey, you know, we're not going to register because uh, uh, those last uh, two three months of uh, you getting back to the player that you were, we're, n- we're not going to play you not for not even for one sure. minute. It's no, Gavi. You're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. That's not wrong. Um, I it just I, I guess we'll have to say like that's one of those. Let's keep an eye on that because if like let's mm-hmm. say it's not till December, then you don't register him. You know what I mean? Because like, right. that's it's one month. That's one. It's one minor setback, and he's not back till December. Yeah, but then what if you what if you don't manage to create the uh, the, the the salary space in in, anyway, the winter, in, in, in in the winter window? You you don't take that risk with a player like right. Ali. Yep. Yeah, and I would hope that, and I would hope the club doesn't do that. So, all right, one last question from the page, from Patreons. This is from oh man, number sign six, the great. Uh, all right. So, what has Xavi done so poorly? This is actually just for you, not even me. What has Xavi done so poorly that the fans, media, pundits, that happy analysts, uh, and management would be glad that he's going? Uh, I would appreciate major deficiencies as opposed to statistically driven minutia. With Barcelona's current financial restrictions and thin roster, this is the second part of this. What would Guardiola or Klopp or Desarbi or Lucho have done any better even? Um, I, I think that one of the, because Xavi knows all about football and Guardiola and Klopp and Luis Enrique and the Zerbi, I don't know that well, um, but they all know about football. Um, and, and all of them sometimes complicate their lives and overthink things and, uh, make, make wrong decisions either during a match or, um, make a wrong game plan before a match that, that happens to everybody, but they all know about football. I think what might be different, uh, is whether they can really, uh, instill the belief in their squad. that they will win the matches on the pitch. Um, because Luis Enrique, like people want for a wall for him and they believe that they will win. Uh, Guardiola, the same thing. Klopp, the same thing. The Zerbi, I'm not going to comment. Like, I, He's just a name for me of a team that I don't watch who everybody tells me is performing brilliantly. Um, when Ta- when Xavi is on the pitch, and this is something that I think I think by now it's uh, noticeable for everybody, um, but as somebody who's always in the stadium, uh, it was even more clear because you see the whole pitch the whole time. Um, he always seems extremely nervous 
on the sidelines. And he constantly yells instructions at his players. It would drive me insane. Or it drives me insane when I play football at the terrible level that I play football with. And I have somebody telling me, hey, pass there, do this, do that all the time. Like, you know, I've, after like the second or third time, I turn around and I tell the guy to shut up and just let me play. Um, so th th this is something that I've picked up, that I've noticed. And I'm always surprised that um, players don't seem particularly bothered by it. Because he would get on my nerves so much. Um, and I don't, I don't know in the grand scheme of things uh, what he is doing different than than those other guys that are mentioned. But I do know that um, those coaches are some of the best coaches in the world. They're probably three of the five best coaches in the world. Pep is the absolute best. Um, Klopp. <laughs> I think it's it's those three and uh, Diego Simeone, who for me are the are the four best coaches in the world. I don't rate Ancelotti that much. Um, I don't think that uh, getting help from referees is a coaching quality. He's doing well, right? Yeah, he's doing well, and yeah, and he's been he's been doing well. But I don't follow Serie A that. Uh, that much, but uh, yeah, he might be special as well. Um, and that, 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 there's just there's just there's just a belief in in those players and those teams that they're going to win games. I, I tend to completely agree with you, and I've said it before in the last few weeks and months that it just feels like um, Xavi again. I compare him to Terry Henry in that when I watch him as a manager, he can't seem to get the things that are in his head and in his mouth, like that he's yelling. And, and have his players, you know, it's just, it's not translatable. I, it, and I think that's something that maybe again, to our, our discussion we just had about him as a manager, like, I don't know if he went through the right steps to be able to, uh, to get the highest level players to understand the ideas that he has in his head. Because, you know, I, I actually did think about this and I looked back and I can say that, you know, I started the show with Valverde. So I really started like watching and taking notes six, seven years ago. And I could say that it didn't happen often. But there would be matches where Valverde from the start, and I know his legacy is about Liverpool and Roman, all that, whatever, that's the negative parts in it. But there were games that he would have where, particularly when Arturo Vidal showed up, where he would get it wrong from the start, and then he would, he would kind of figure it out. Or Barcelona would get a draw, or it just wouldn't work out. And I could see that he had, he had an idea for what the team is, but he would get like his tactics wrong compared to the other team. And Kuman, that was my one knock on Kuman too, where like, Kuman got it wrong from the start quite a bit where he would he would line up his team or he would or he wasn't fully prepared for what the other team was going to do and I'd be like I know he did the homework but he had to fix it by the fifth or eighth minute to Xavi's credit and I will say this I think most of our criticism by Xavi have been I mean yes he has a thin bench anyway and all the injuries but I think his substitution pattern and how he closes games is how we've been critical to Xavi, even though Barca has picked up a ton of late points as well. So the numbers, you want to talk about st uh, statical, uh, statistical minutia, the numbers don't back up this argument, but the vibes that we watch with say that he actually gets it right from the jump quite often. Like usually he gets it right from the jump, the way he builds his lineup and sets up his team in comparison to the other team. He does his homework, but it's like, but it's that in-game management. It's how you, how you deal with the different phases of the play when the other team adapts to you, especially at halftime. Right, like Barcelona haven't been great coming out of halftime a lot, as if Xavi's kind of getting one up once that half, once the adaptations begin. But again, to his credit, I think his X and O's he gets it so right because whatever they drilled to start the game with seems to. I, I'm always like, yeah, that completely makes sense to me. I, even even the most recent ad thing he's done with Araujo as a left back and Kubarsi as the the right, I mean, not left back, but you know, left center back and Kubarsi as a right center back, it worked. And I was like, oh, this is great. This worked. And Xavi not agreed with me, but, you know, Xavi was like, yeah, this actually works. It's a change that they made. And now they're sticking with it. And they should because it, it made sense and it works and it opens up things. And I, I think Xavi has leaned into whatever worked uh, every time something goes well. Let's also remember that last season, like, uh, think, things went wrong in, uh, in, in Europe, but he did win La Liga against a pretty strong Real Madrid or at least a, a financially healthy 
um, European champion, Real Madrid. So we, we, we won La Liga. Uh, and our, our defense was incredibly strong. Now, what happened this summer? Why is our defense all of a sudden so bad? Well, there, there's one name that explains this. And it's, it's a name that no fans are going to accept. Um, because according, according to them, this person was the root of all of Barcelona's problems, even though uh, Ronald Koeman, Luis Enrique, uh, as, as Spain coach, and Xavi all said that he was fundamental to our defense. Busquets left. So if Sergio Busquets leaves, and our defense just falls apart. No, and we never replaced him. So in, in, in this sense, he's also been, uh, you know, that this was not, a, not an easy challenge for him. Um, I do think that sometimes he could have handled things better with the press. Um, I think he steps into the victim role uh, a, a, a bit too easily. He already did that as a player. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that that is the best way to lead a team. You know, if you if you make excuses, if you say, well, you know, the other team is uh, so defensive that it makes it very difficult. Uh, if you say, well, you know, uh, uh, the press is hurting our players um, and it impacts them, you, you are not making your players stronger. You are not making them believe in themselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, those, those are just very, very small examples because I'm sure that he does a lot of things right, uh, as in textbook motivational stuff. And I'm sure that a lot of players absolutely love him, but uh, that there are just some guys and the three guys that, uh, uh, that your dude mentioned, Pep, Klopp and Luis Enrique are some of the strongest examples. Uh, th th there's something about them that really motivates their their team and, and, and makes those teams go all out and believe in themselves. And that, that, that's what we are missing. More than anything, it's that belief that we are missing because it cannot be possible that you go out on the pitch with a, with a team, even with our injuries and our challenges, with a team that is five times, six times, seven times, eight times more expensive than your opponents and not create a single chance like we did against... Uh, pretty much Bilbao's bench this weekend. It's, it's not possible. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, okay, so here's an easy one. We had, th we had three questions about injuries. Uh, and Roj, you have, he <laughs> wanted to ask us about Dembele, but it's the same idea. Dembele being healthy the moment he leaves Barcelona. Uh, Frederick talks about the Barca medical staff, and that's why I made a joke about Ricard Pruna, um, because he was the big guy that Xavi wouldn't want to bring back to the club. Um, the, the medio. So, and then people are asking about the high tendency for player injuries. Uh, Aaron Moses, 83, asked the same thing. Why are Barcelona have all these injuries? Um, and one of my favorite followers on uh, the, the website, formerly known as Twitter, uh, he doesn't say much anymore, but uh, Captain Guardiola, I think, summed it up really well. And I'm, I want to quote, actually quote him here because I think he said it perfectly. Barca's injury crisis can't be attributed to a single factor. It's a mix of young players still managing to, ma uh, still learning to manage their efforts and health imperfect medical staff, increased game load, and a flawed structure that demands constant physical efforts to compensate for errors. And I think he is 100% right. I almost have like nothing to add. I think all of that says it, that like even there are so many times with the press that I say, you could see what the idea was, but then like Pedri and Fermi Lopez, like if Fermi Lopez is the next to get injured, I would not all be surprised because you see when that effort that's required in the press when they're not pressing all together and it's not one fluid content, you know, unit. And so there are so many moments in a game when I'm circling Pedri and going, he's pressing now, but that's not his, that's not where he's supposed to be in like in a, in a rest set, in a set defense, like a rest defense that is where it's supposed to be because Christensen, I'm noticing even as a pivot, he's made the whole structure better and he has made Gundogan so much better. And Gundogan, on all of it, on tackles, positioning, where he is on the field, it's all flowing a lot better with Christensen, the big picture. But Christensen has not been exactly where he needed to be on the press. So I know, I mean, no, I know Pedri's gone to not, to, 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 so he can't be an example of this anymore. But I can guarantee you in the next five weeks, without Frankie de Young in particular, 
that press is going to be a disaster. And it was against Athletic Club the minute De Young and Pedri were gone. Like the the press in the second half was almost non-existent. And where I felt like in the first 15 minutes, they had some ideas to it. And they were dealing with it pretty well, even though Ernesto already had that plan to stay uh, very narrow vertically. I still felt like Barcelona had some ideas to work around that uh, and, and what Athletic Club were kind of doing with that high line. But once they lost De Young and Pedri, it was completely thrown out the window. And there's a difference between working hard and working successfully in con- you know, it, with a combined effort. And I think this is a team that works hard, which gets them injured, but it's not a combined effort together. And, and that winds up, yeah, just leaving guys too overextended to the job that they're supposed to be doing. And again, you get hurt when you're slotting in for tackles late or cleaning up mistakes. That's how you get hurt more than is defending on the front foot. That's why Busquets very rarely never got hurt because he defended on the front foot so often. And he read the game in front of him. And so much, it's, it's easier to not get injured when you're reading the game in front of you. Also, also it helps that uh, Busquets is not an explosive uh, That's player. True. Yeah. Um, uh, just like I never get injured and I play football every week when I never get injured because I'm slow. Uh, I'm slow and I'm heavy. So you get injured when you play with me. So you just bounce off of me. But, well, I, <laughs> but, I, but I, don't, I don't get injured. <laughs> Why well, I, so like, I don't get injured a lot because when I see two big bodies going up, I know that I don't want to be a part of that anymore. You know, I'm old enough to be like, that might be the end of me. So You'll say, uh, oh, you, you, I'll, I'll still, I'll still find you. I'll still find you. <laughs> um, one point. And I say, well, it's a game to 15. We got 15 other points. I'll get it back later. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor or anything to, to comment on uh, Barcelona's medical staff. So, you know, you have a lot of people uh, talking about this, like, honestly, what, what on earth do you know about uh, physical preparation in, in football? Nothing, nothing. So I have nothing to say about that. But what, what I will say, and this is, uh, I think, the most damaging thing uh, Xavi has done as a coach is, uh, you know, Ansu Fati came back from injury. Uh, Ricard Pruna told him, told Xavi, he cannot play more than 30 minutes. What does Xavi do? Uh, put him on this in the 60th minute and then let him play in overtime against Bilbao. So after 40 minutes, he suffered that muscle injury that he still has not completely recovered from. Um, so, you know, uh, Chavi made a huge deal of bringing Pruna back and then he did not listen to him when he advised him on, uh, our biggest talent who came back from a devastating injury. And that is something that, uh, uh, we can absolutely, it's absolutely fair to, to blame Xavi and hold him responsible for that. Uh, that, that, that was just horrible. Uh, I fear the same for uh, like Petri and Gavi. They're just, they're just kids. When they were given like all of the responsibility and all of the minutes over a whole season. And not just for Barcelona, but also for Spain. So Petri, he was fine until he got called up for the, for the Olympics after already playing Euros. Like he should have, he should have just refused. Or the, pe- the people around him should have forced him to refuse. That was completely irresponsible. Um, Gavi, he got injured in a meaningless friendly. Uh, so um, B- Barcelona wants to play with the big boys wants to, because that's what our fan base demands. Um, it, in order to be competitive, we, we play the same players all over. We don't have the kind of squad that Manchester City does or the kind of squad that, uh, that Madrid does so that we can rotate more. We just don't. I mean, but even the, even the Carabao Cup with Liverpool, like, I think when I think about young players, I know, and we didn't actually get a question about this, but when I think about young players, like, for example, people say, well, who's in the future? And I, I, I've, I've said, and actually Abbas asked a question that I'll answer right now here. Is there anything positive to say? And I said, of course, like, and it's a, it's a pro and a con at the moment because this La Masia generation of kids born 2005, 2008 is the most talented group as a collective that I've seen in all my years caring about La Masia, which is about 20 years now. 
So even people ask about Pablo Torre or whatever, I'm telling you, Guy Fernandez is 15. So he's like two or three years away. But that guy has such a, that kid has such a higher ceiling than Pablo Torre that I could part with Pablo Torre knowing that you have a like for like replacing him with a higher ceiling in Guy Fernandez in all the ways, physically, technically, whatever. But so, but pretty much every other club would dream of that kind of cheap and high level talent. And yes, you do have to increase yeah. their weight and pay them when they get to the first team. But those deals are usually much better than the same talent from outside the club, you know, team friendly deals. Um, but to that point, like in the Cowbell Cup, I'm watching and Liverpool had all those those youngsters. Right. And I, I went and I looked at those youngsters. And, you know, when people ask me, well, you know, who's the next whatever? And I tell you, OK, Lamini Mall, very excited about like there, there are. And I, actually, I was thinking about this, too. I, I know it's a run on sentence, but I almost wanted to almost add percentages to what percentage I think this kid gets in the first team to that kid. Right. Um, because they're all potentially first team players somewhere. It's just a matter of where they're going to wind up and how much how much I believe in them. And so like Lamini Mall, Pau Gabarsi, Hector Fort, those are three kids that I'm like, yeah, I think those three kids are probably in the first team. I think, again, Guy Fernandez, I find him to be a high, high, high level talent in, in the academy as well. And then you'll have people bring up like Mark Costado. So for example, I've said it many times, I don't think Mark Costado is a future first team player at Barcelona, but I think he's a first team player somewhere in the Liga that can contribute the way that Manchu and the way that uh, players that many Barcelona players that Patrick at, at, at Lazio even, who's now 30 mm -hmm. years old, like, there are so many, like he has a future in first team football. He's good enough for that. Like, uh, you know, Oriol Romeo. Or Romeo, exactly. Good example. <laughs> He's been out for a long time. So, but, but to that point in the Carabao Cup about Liverpool, I think to your point about the youngsters, like the, the Liverpool kids who played in that match were both the kids that were definitely going to succeed and then the kids who were just coming up in the academy that are going to be living their first team lives somewhere else. And so right. because we've not seen Costa do it all this year, that is a frustrating thing. Like, but because we, but we, 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 we don't have a Carabao, we, we don't have a fourth cup where we can play no, those kids, right? No, no, there, there so. isn't. But, but I mean, but there, but there, I mean, there isn't, but it's like, how much do you care about the Copa del Rey? Barcelona did because Xavi needed to get a trophy. But why right, does Xavi but, need to get the Copa del Rey? But how many more kids are going to play, man? The average age on I know, no, I on, I, on, I, on, on, on the pitches already, like... Yeah. I hear that. It's insanely young. Well, the only reason you're playing more kids is because you don't have the squad. Because I, I totally agree with you. If I would rather have, in theory, you'd rather want to play Sergio Roberto or Romeo over Casado, which is what Xavi does. And that makes sense to me. Um, but to, to that point, like you're, if you're, if you're just losing bodies, you know, mm -hmm. helter skelter because week in week out, then that would be the, then you can't. Is, is Labina Mal's body ready for professional football? Like with the minutes that he's getting, no, but nobody, no sixteen-year-old is three thousand minutes is too much for every six any sixteen-year-old. It doesn't matter who it is; like nobody is available for that. You, you know, so um, was Gabi's for that matter. Um, More so, but no, again, no sixteen-year-old is ready for three thousand minutes. Pedri, same thing. Even Ansu, even Ansu, who physically at 16, looked like he was the most prepared for that kind of minutes compared to the guys that we just mentioned as a 16-year-old. As a he, and, the same way. Was, but he also, he played less minutes than those three. But even he, him, he, he, like, played he, he played the right, right amount of minutes. And then uh, when they started giving him like uh, uh, real minutes, when he became a starter, he was 18 already. Uh, I think well, people forget that Ansu had a, had a huge injury when he was in the Masia as well. At 14, he broke uh, his leg. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, if if we're talking injuries in Barcelona, this, this, is, this is where the biggest risk is. Like, uh, we need to be competitive. In order to be competitive, all of a sudden we have these kids who are amazing and who play better than anybody else, but their bodies are not ready for it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then they get injured. I think Frankie... Uh, Frankie's injury was more like uh, what happened? He fell on somebody's foot or something. You know, it's that that's not something that you can prevent. Correct. Yeah, Frankie's is a, a freak injury with a, is a yeah. ankles get rolled. It happens. Like as long as he doesn't need to have. Uh, and Kevin mentioned him last week. I'll mention it again. Like the NBA player Grant Hill, who had all these um, ankle injuries. That's a different example. We have to have surgery on like a broken ankle or something. But Frankie's is a sprained ankle. It's even a low ankle sprain. So like he'll be fine in four to five weeks. Like just. Wait it out, and he'll likely be a hundred percent in four to five weeks. So you don't have to yeah. worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, M Madrid also had a crazy amount of injuries this season, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah, you know they they were without Courtois, 
And Courtois is basically who won them the trophies the last couple of seasons. And Courtois yeah. and the referees. Um, and Benzema. Benzema was the last few years, too. And Benz. Uh, and they were without um, uh, Militao the whole season. So I, I think Kamavinga was injured for some time. Uh, they've had their share of in- injuries as well, man. They had yeah. Kawa playing central defender just a couple of weeks ago. Well, yeah, Kava Hall is pretty much the only one that's been healthy. And to, to that point, actually, about you say about De Young, like I know De Young got hurt twice this year, but he in his career has largely been healthy. And he's a guy like we talk about Busquets the same way. I know he's not quick twitch, but that guy eats up minutes, just minute after minute. And then even um, Christensen, who apparently is dealing with this Achille, Achilles tendon thing. That's why he can't play 90 minutes and comes off. Jules Kunde did get hurt early in this year, but. When he signed, one of the first things that I was steadfast about was that he has a fantastic injury record. And I know he missed a little bit, but he has now played the entirety of the last 15 matches. And that being all the matches in 2024, 1380 out of the possible 1380 minutes. So he needs a rest, sure. But I mean, Kunde is not a player that generally gets injured. And I think to that point, too, like when I look at the squad, I can tell you that I expect Araujo to get hurt. And, and this is the case in all of sports. Yeah, I, I was just, I was just, I was just going to mention it. I was yeah. just going to mention that dude, man, because he always gets hurt. Right, Araujo gets hurt. Pedri gets hurt. Um, like Gabi's ACL is basically Gabi's first major injury. So he's young. So we talk about him in a different way. But like, and and even even Balde, like Balde has gotten hurt a bunch in his. Like he's been pretty injury prone throughout his time in the academy as well. Uh, in a way that again, that Kunde has not been, that De Young has not been. Rafinha, believe it or not, has a pretty good record of not getting hurt. Same thing with Lewandowski. Like, Lewandowski played through the back injury last year, but, like, that dude doesn't – he eats up minutes. Like, he doesn't really get hurt either. And you really do, for Barcelona squad, put them in two camps. Like, Roberto has always had nagging injuries his whole career, too. And Ori Romeu is almost always healthy. I know – and even him, he's been hurt this year. And I there are reports that he's been struggling with some stuff, discomfort all year, too. But, I mean, he's also – he's an interesting thing where it's like he's coming back in the age of 30. And the same thing with Ter Stegen. Ter Stegen was always generally healthy – but he's had this back stuff and now he's, you know, 30 plus and it's, it's not, you know, you and I are both <laughs> 30 plus. Like it doesn't get, your back doesn't get better. It just, you just now live with it. You're managing it and you're tolerating it. But yeah, I mean, Barcelona, if anything, my advice would be sign more players, like sign more players that, that have a good track record of always being on the field <laughs> would be like maybe that the next thing. Cause you just need, you just need players to eat up minutes. Um, okay. We have three questions left. Uh, and these are big questions, all fun questions about the club. So Alex asked, do you believe that Victor Font would be doing a better job with the club's finance, given he had a step-by-step structured plan rather than Laporta banking on his pack's success? Um, I don't think this question is wrong, but I want to remind you, I, I, I went back and deep dived on uh, C. Alcuter, which was the project that, that, that he marketed. I mean, it really was a well-marketed thing. And it, it really was a lot about names, about how he had Xavi kind of overseeing all of the general manager, then he had Kuman underneath, and he was going to keep on Garcia Pimienta. And it, it was a lot of names that he had to be a part of it. Um, but in terms of the actual plans he had, we have actually seen a bunch of them come to a head under Laporta anyway, which includes selling products directly to supporters without intermediaries, which you're seeing what's literally being floated about the last few weeks about the kit manufacturing negotiations. He wanted to... Uh, the, he wanted an ex-president's council, which to me seemed like a stupid idea, and I'm glad it was thrown out. Uh, electronic voting, which it was changed that way anyway in November of 2021. So within a, like a few months of the, the, the election, that, that idea was taken. Focus on developing e-commerce opportunities and find ways to monetize online content. And we did see the end of Barca TV and then the start of this new Barca 1 streaming. So that has been uh, a function. The S by Barca referendum, which had to be done anyway for the for the club members to vote on the S by Barca project for the the stadium. So uh, the only big difference, the only real big difference, was that he wanted to limit the power of the board to that of grand strategic decisions, granting more power to the CEO. That's maybe the one huge difference because we know that Laporta is much more hands on than I think Victor Font said he wanted to be. But who knows? Victor Font might have been as hands on as Laporta is because you are the president of FC Barcelona and all eyes are on you. So that would be, I think, the only difference. And also, Jordi Cruyff was supposed to be a huge part of the project in terms of like doing a lot of the CEO work underneath the board. And once he left and they lost some of that brain trust, I think there's been a little bit of a vacuum of 
you know, who's making decisions and people from the board and the board has taken a more hands-on approach since you've seen the exodus of, um, of Planas and of uh, Cruyff and then of um, Alemani. So like you, you've just seen an exodus of different suits behind the scenes of making decisions. And, uh, you know, that, I mean, that's why you hear from Deco now all the time because he really has absorbed some of the responsibilities of others. So um, I switched my vote from Fon to Laporta. I did not want Laporta to run. Um, I supported Font uh, throughout uh, La Motion de Censura, uh, which, which I voted in, the, the motion of no confidence. Uh, and um, the, re the reason I switched to Laporta and I ended up voting for Laporta was because Xavi was uh, very much the focal point of uh, Victor Font's campaign. And um, Xavi did not come out in support of Font during the campaign. So I thought, hey, you know, if uh, if you lack the um, the personality to to have that guy um, be, be your spare point uh, and pretty much say like, hey, you know, I like the other candidate too. Um, everything everything fell apart for Victor Font from there. And I'm pretty sure that I'm not the only person who, uh, who felt that way. Um, I was afraid for Laporta uh, coming in without a strong plan. Um, but you never know what would have happened if Font had won. Maybe we would be in the same situation. I don't know. Um, would Font have been able to hang on to Lionel Messi? If so, would that be because he had signed uh, the the CVC deal with uh, with Tebas? Um, how would that have impacted uh, the Barcelona finances? Um, would hanging on to Lionel Messi um, have impacted some of our income streams as well? Most likely, right? Uh, would we have resorted to palancas? Would we have signed so many expensive players that uh, have salary costs and amortization costs, uh, which are counting against us right now with, with the salary cap. Um, I'm, I would be willing to bet that our sit financial situation would be better on the front right now for, for those reasons. Would you think the product on the field would have been better though? That I do not know. Right. I, that that's... I, don't know. I, I, I do think that if um, if we had the guts to uh, um, not sign Lewandowski, Rafinha, Kunde, um, those were basically the three people that we spent money on in the I mean, Palancas, even, right? And I, I, even I feel I'm signing... missing a fourth one. Uh, well, Christensen was a free transfer. Exactly. Christensen and uh, Kessier were, were free. Yeah. Um, because I, I really liked how Xavi took over from Kuman, and we added all of these players who came on a free, uh, except, uh, uh, Ferran Torres, who, who arrived for 50 mil. And I liked how we were playing that second half of the season. Eh? And I don't, I, I, I don't think, but I don't think that we are playing better now. Then we were playing then. Yeah. I think the one one what if really is I, I just not last season when they when Barcelona won the Liga, I think the big revolving door is if you don't go for because even even in terms of the salary, if you don't go for Lewandowski, because Kunde and Kunde and uh, uh Rafinha, they do fit in the salary structure. Lewandowski is the one that doesn't really fit. He just his wages are very high. So if you don't go for Lewandowski you can still afford the other two. Uh, and I mean, and so you don't have to, you don't have to go all in with the levers. So if and then let's say you decide to sign on for 10 mil or whatever, um, Luke de Young, and you decide for some reason to keep uh, Obama Yang, right? And instead of giving Lewandowski, right? You decide to like find ways to go forward with those two. There is an argument that Lewandowski did fire Barcelona to the La Liga title last season with his contributions from August to December. So, there is this world where the the 
your Barcelona is one La Liga title short, which means they have not won a title in three years. Then, if that, I mean, I, I mean, I guess yes. Last season, the Spanish Super Cup. But let's say they, yeah, let's say they still do win the Spanish Super Cup. But really, you're talking about now one trophy, the Spanish Super Cup, which is the least vaulted of all the, the ones we're talking about, and that's the only cup they won in three years. That uh, it's be, not even a trophy, man. Like, right, it's exactly. Half a trophy. It's, yeah, it's only go trophy list for three seasons. And so even if the financial picture is better, he, you're still going to probably, I mean, what, at that point, because it's Victor Font and not the magnanimous Laporta, I can guarantee you without a trophy by this third season, there'd be a motion to censure on Victor Font, even if financially things are better. I don't I know. Think- I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I think, uh, uh, and, and I talk to a lot of people here and a, 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 a lot of us would be willing to, to accept uh, less less success for a couple of years. Um, what what gets us is that we're spending all of this money, and we're still playing like crap. And we have to worry about okay, wait, which players are we going to end up losing this summer? And for sure, they're not the players that we just spent the money on that we shouldn't have signed anyway. You know, so um, I I think that we could have won the league uh, last season without the Palancas. I mean, for God's sake, we we beat Madrid 4-0 at the at the Bernabeu before the Palancas. So there's no reason that we could not win a league against them. Um, and also, I think had we not won the league without the Palancas, people would be okay with it. So uh, in 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 this sense, I think that uh, um, I, I'm disappointed with uh, with Laporta because I I think financially uh, we're looking more unstable now than when we started, and um, with with mu- not much to yeah. show for it. Yeah, I think that second part I agree with more. I think it feels about the same. As I said, I I'd like to see where the club is at once the stadium is done. So I'm still. I, I, again, like it, it, I know it feels like it's been forever because it's, I mean, basically it's been since COVID, but you know, I, I think once give give it to like the end of 2025 until I'm, and if the club is still in the same financial situation, if FFP is still a worry, if registering players is still a concern, you know, then, then, then I'll, I think then I'll really, you know, have the referendum and, 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 and... His, his mandate is until about 25, 26. Right. So basically, as oh. his mandate is up, right, as his mandate yeah. is up is when I, it's, it's, it, in theory, should get right. Yeah. Um, okay. So the other big decision, two questions left. Tomas asks, with the recent news that the Nike contract might be ended, how good of an idea do you think it is to have the jerseys made in-house? I have no idea. I'm not in the jersey making business. None um, of us are. Neither is FC Barcelona, <laughs> and that would be my one concern. <laughs> that would be, that would be the problem, right? That um, I, I think Bilbao and Mallorca have actually done this, uh, and then reverted to um, uh, to a sponsor, which is very interesting because um, Bilbao and Mallorca don't sell internationally, so. Right. Um, you know, they they don't get the kind of sponsor money, sponsorship money that. Uh, well, it's not sponsorship. They don't get the uh, shirt deals with manufacturers that Barcelona uh, gets. Uh, but in theory, it should be easier for a club to control uh, this and make money off this if your market is pretty much just domestic. And you know, let's. Let's be fair, uh, not just domestic. Your market is very local because there's not many people outside of Mallorca who walk around in Mallorca shirts. It's funny. I did try to order a Mallorca shirt um, years ago. This is like, I want to say like 2012. I really liked their kit that season. And I tried to order a Mallorca shirt. And that is when I learned that you, I couldn't order it internationally. And I like looked everywhere and I was like, there's no, there's no, like the only one was like an extra large on eBay here in the United States. But, but even to that point though, I actually, you know, the, uh, like the original, like the, 
the one with the collar, the, the, the old one from like the 1899 with the original logo and everything. That one that they sell in store is not, they don't sell that internationally. So my concerns already would be that if Barcelona's store as it's currently constructed does not even sell internationally, like I, I would be concerned about the undertaking of like, again, I'm not, I'm not in sales, but the, the, the supply chain would be a concern to me. It just seems like Barcelona shouldn't be taking on all that other stuff because now you've got to hire so many other people and it just it seems like a, a big undertaking for what may not be the reward that they're looking for because because now because then as I said, then you're tying the number of jersey sales which should be enough but then you're tying that directly to your economic success as well as opposed to going in with a contract and basically knowing your minimums you wouldn't necessarily know your minimums here even though the maximums would be much higher i'm the, the crazy thing I, what, what, what I think is that th they should wait until the contract with Nike, with Nike is finished and just do it then. Because you, you go into this now, um, if it is successful, uh, because unlike Bilbao and unlike Mallorca, Barca's brand name is a lot stronger. So, you know, uh, I don't know. Um, Foot Locker is going to want to sell Barca shirts. Um, you know, th th those big sports chains um, and the big online sellers, uh, they're going to want to sell Barcelona shirts. So th the market is there. But um, why break your contract with Nike? You're going to you're gonna end up losing money to Nike because, you know, it's a contract. We've paid. Nike has paid us for the right to manufacture and sell our shirts. So we're going to lose money to Nike at a time where we really cannot lose money. Uh, even if we don't end up losing the money, we have to set the money aside for litigation, which screws us more with um, with the salary cap and everything. Um, and if it is something... Nike aside, that we could pull off ourselves, it's going to take a couple of years to get that distribution set up going uh, in a way that we can get the best deals. Because I'm pretty sure that Nike gets better distribu distribution deals uh, than than Barcelona can. Well, so... particularly particularly in the continent of Africa, Nike and the the distribution deals with Nike in the country uh, in, in the continent of Africa and in Asia is better than some other brands. In Africa, that I know from somebody who works at Nike. Like I just know that, yeah, like the Nike, like Nike distribution to Africa is like it's pretty, is like one of the better, one of the better companies yeah, yeah. that gets up to Africa. And yeah, but Asia, who cares? Everybody wears Africa. who cares? Every, everybody wears counterfeit shirts there. Well, that well, not necessarily, but but those are markets that the club is looking to continue to expand into, as well as yeah, but, the United States. But that's that's not a market where you're going to make money. I lived in South America. No, nobody buys a hundred dollar shirt in South America. You buy you buy the ten dollar shirt from the guy who sells them in the corner, or even even at the stores they sell the counterfeit shirts. Like at the mall, they sell the counterfeit shirts in the in the stores. So I don't think I don't think Africa is that different. Uh, Asia, however, like especially Japan, um, you 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 want to have like presence there. So yeah, I, I have no I, no idea how the club would pull that off. I don't I don't work in that business, um, but I do think that uh, you know if if you can pull it off, you're gonna end up making more money. So I I, I don't I don't think the idea is crazy. I just don't don't know if you wanna uh, do it right now. I agree with that. The contract ends with Nike in 2028. And to your point, I think the club is in a current situation, as I just said with the stadium, high risk, high reward. And that's what that jersey sale would be. And I think as we just said about the timeline of the club, 2028, when the Nike contract is up, that is when you do the high risk, high reward. And if you're not happy with the next jerseys for the next three, four seasons, like I, there's been a lot of garbage jerseys that have been released and like just <laughs> go back and forth a few more times, right? And get, get something that you want. Um, okay, so last question here. And this one's pretty easy, Steven. Uh, Steven asks, how many times in Barcelona's history have they been in financial trouble? So thankfully, last week, and I get to plug this with the iceberg video collaboration that Robbie and I did, 
Um, I covered it last week in different eras. You might have heard me pop up with different topics. Things financially were pretty bleak in the 40s, the 60s, and the 70s in particular. Those three decades in particular, um, which you might notice do correspond with a certain dictatorship that was going on at the same time. Uh, even in the early 80s, the economy in Spain was still struggling. And Barcelona as a club were recovering. And some other clubs in Spain were not. And you can say that same story about the 90s and the 2000s, especially during the global crisis. Talk to Valencia about the what they're still dealing with from the, from the financial crisis in uh, 2008 and all that. Um, but yes, in particular, financially, Barcelona was even in worse shape in the 40s, the 60s, and the 70s. Um, but as kind of has been the through line through this, Barcelona very much like whatever they are, Liverpool, AC Milan, Bayern Munich, Inter, Inter Milan. At this point, these clubs that have been around for 120 years, 100 whatever, they are brands that exist. They continue to carry on through good times, through bad times. It's, it's you know, but um, it's been pretty bleak in other times a, as well. And worse in those times too, because there wasn't, like Barcelona's now a global, they were not a global club at that time. I mean, it was, it was very much domestic. It was very much local. Now they have a there are now they are a global brand. Football is, is global. TV rights have changed all of those things, and TV and all that has, has just you know flipped it all up on its head. So it, it's been it, there have been worse situations than the one that Barcelona is currently in. Uh, yeah, I mean um, Barcelona even had to play like uh, touring Mexico and stuff for for six months um, in the 40s, yep. because because the city here was getting bombed. Uh, mm-hmm. During during the civil war by Franco's troops, um, what what is interesting is like if we were poor financially in the 60s, which I'm not familiar with, but the Camp Nou was finished in 1957. Yeah. So you would not necessarily expect uh, the the decade after uh, for us to be in financial trouble. You would hope it's it's the opposite. Um, and, and in the seventies, we actually broke the, the transfer record when we signed, uh, Johan Cruyff. Yep. In 74. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I so, mean, the only problem is that, yeah, that's what I mean. And also so curious even to, time, to know more about what happened, uh, what happened then. Well, that's what I mean. Even when times when the club was financially struggling, there was still, there was, I mean, same thing with Maradona. Maradona was also transfer fee, uh, record True. as well yeah. as, as was Brazilian Ronaldo. Like they were. So Barcelona continues through these times of even financial struggle and 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 unrest and, and unrest and all that stuff because I will, you know, if you go back to the signing of Johan Cruyff to that point, he was a risk. Like that was a big number for Barcelona. I mean, yes, it was a world transfer fee at the time, but that was in theory that was money that they didn't really have to spend, and they did it anyway, and they won the yeah. Liga. And basically, it paid off. But Barcelona, Barcelona, we're like the club that we don't have money to spend, but we still go and get like the biggest. Mm-hmm. Uh, the biggest uh, high definition TV screen that we can that we can find, right? Yeah, I mean that's basically been the case in football in general since the '70s for Barcelona. Like they still go get the yeah go get the fancy TV even if it's not in the budget, and they say hey we'll figure it we'll figure it out. And you know, so I know it feels like it's like a new thing about Laporta, but like this is how the club's been run for now going on 50 years basically. So uh, as I said, it's, it's, that's, that's what you signed up for being a kool being a Barcelona fan. Um, and, and, and Levon and I will be with you because as Levon said to me before we went on air, you cannot, things change in your life, but you can't, can't get rid of your football club. And, and that, that's very true. So uh, anyway, you can follow Levon uh, on social media if you want to. Uh, um, and then, you cannot follow me on social media because I'm no longer on social media. He's not on social media anymore. So uh, you can't find him. You just have to hear him here. So that, that's your choice. So, so uh, and, and enjoy the show. I hope you enjoyed the show. And we are, I'm on Twitter, I should say, the Barcelona Podcast, Hope be 13. Thanks for helping me get over 2,000. Took a long time, but <laughs> took 15 years, but we're over 2,000 just as the website's about to explode. So Instagram as well. And as I said, Patreon, that's how we got the first questions that were guaranteed to be answered. Close Facebook group, Discord. Thank you for the questions over there as well. And then a good rating on the podcast app, subscribing YouTube channel. That's the biggest help for the show. That is how you share it with the most people. But as always, thanks so much for listening to the show. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Forza Barca. Vizca Barca.